Let's open our worship in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And today we continue our series of Guided to the Cross. We're examining how we're drawn to Calvary to receive peace. In the word and song, we contemplate how to live our lives uh, in, in our souls and our minds that with that peace that Christ and only Christ can provide for us. Amen. And at this time, we have our march to the cross, which I already saw. We have some items up here, and I noticed there were some other items downstairs already. Uh, so if anyone has anything, otherwise we will ask a blessing uh, over these things. And also, just to let you know that uh, Crops Eat is going to be donating some meat from their pancake and sausage uh, days yesterday uh, to our food pantry as well this week. Would you be a word of prayer? Lord, we once again thank you for being able to not only host a food pantry, but also to provide the, uh, some of the food that is given out there. And Lord, just may you bless these items and especially bless the families that will receive them. May they come to know how much you love them through the simple act of us providing them food and necessities that they need for everyday living. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. And now we uh, listen to the prayer this morning as we center our thoughts on our worship today. <coughs>
are often filled with worry and fear. Jesus tells us, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. Not let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. John 14, verse 27. Jesus, our Savior, when we are troubled and worried, The world's peace depends on the absence of war and strife and trouble. The peace that Jesus brings to us is not like the world's peace. The peace of Jesus depends only on Jesus. The world's peace can be lost, but the peace that Jesus brings to us is ours forever. Jesus, our Savior, even in times of trouble, Thank you. 
circumstances of life and the dangers and concerns of the world around us. Threaten the peace that we have. Help us to remember your promise that you will be with us always to the end of the age. Make us bold witnesses with you so that with the power of the Holy Spirit, Others will come to know the peace that you alone can bring. Set your cross before us and guide us in the way of peace. Amen. Today's scripture reading is taken from Colossians 1, verses 15 through 20. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. If he existed before anything else and he holds a creation together, Christ is also the head of the church which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. This is the first for a while. Little kids today. I miss that. Would you be in a word of prayer with me this morning? Lord, we do thank you for waking us up and getting us going this morning and bringing us here to worship you. And Lord, just open our ears, our hearts, and our minds to hear this message that you have for us today. And Father, I just ask that you empty me out of myself and fill me up with your Holy Spirit so the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart are acceptable in your sight, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. A long time ago, a man sought the perfect picture of peace. <laughs> And not finding one that really satisfied him, he announced a contest to produce this masterpiece that he thought would depict peace in its fullness. And so the challenge stirred the imaginations of artists everywhere, and the painting started arriving from far and wide. And finally, the day of a great revelation arrived. And the judges uncovered one peaceful scene after another. While the viewers clapped and cheered because they were beautiful paintings. But the tensions began to grow because only two pictures remained veiled. And as the judge pulled the cover from one, a hush fell over the crowd. It was a picture of a mirror smooth lake reflecting a lacy green birch <coughs> trees under the soft blush of the evening sky. And along the grassy shore, flock of sheep grazed undisturbed. Surely, they all thought, this must be the winner. The man with the vision uncovered the second painting himself, and the crowd gasped in surprise. Could this be peace? It was a picture of a tumultuous waterfall that cascaded down a rocky precipice, and the crowd could almost feel its cold and penetrating spray as it splashed down. Stormy gray clouds threatened to explode with lightning and wind and rain. But in the midst of all this thundering noise and bitter chill, a spiny little tree clung to the rocks at the edge of the falls. And on one of its branches there, that reached out in front of this torrential waterfall, like it was foolishly seeking to experience its full power in the elbow of that little branch, a bird had chosen to build its nest. Content 
and undisturbed by her stormy surroundings, she rested on her eggs. With her eyes closed and her wings ready to cover her little ones, she manifested God's peace that transcends all of our earthly turmoil. And this is uh, from Brigitte Kuss from the book entitled A Wardrobe from the King. So welcome back to our Guiding to the Cross worship series for Lent. And today we're taking a look at how we are guided to peace in this season. Now I'm going to ask you to do something that might bring a little discomfort for your peace. We're going to actually have some interaction this morning. And that's right, audience participation is welcome, which means you actually have to talk to any of this. So here's the first question. What word would you say is the opposite of peace? What's the opposite of peace? War. War. Chaos. Chaos. Turmoil. Turmoil. Anybody from this side? Storms? <laughs> so then how, since we know what it's not, how would you define peace? That one might, that one might be tougher, isn't it? Calm. Calm? Comfort. Comfort. That's a good word. That's a good word. Comfort. Any others? So, I want to ask you the third question. Where do you go to find peace? Where do you find your peace at? In when bed. You, in bed? You find your peace in bed. All right. Good, honest answer. Where, else do you, where do you go to, when you want to center yourself, when you've just been overwhelmed with everything, where do you go? What do you seek out to find that peace and calmness? A quiet place? Prayer. Prayer? Nature. Nature. That's my, that's right up right my alley. That would be my answer right there. Yeah, all great things, right? Places we go to find our peace and to center ourselves. And so the last question, do you think that peace is actually possible in today's world, given all the chaos that's around it? I, I see some head shaking. No, not really. Well, I think we can all agree that peace is very hard to come by, and especially these days. We're so busy just running around from one thing to another, and we're surrounded by the sounds of people all around us at home or at work or at school. And any quiet moments that we have can instantly be shattered and interrupted by our phones ringing or a siren that's blasting or cars honking. <coughs> or a video or some sort of music that might be playing that doesn't sound peaceful to us. The lack of peace in our day might be one reason why meditation and these no-technology retreat weekends are becoming more and more popular. Uh, have you ever heard of them, right? You go to a retreat and you have to leave your cell phone off for the day while you're actually experiencing a retreat? Ooh, what a novel concept, right? It reminds you of the days when the phones were attached to the wall, there were no such thing as answering machines, and oh, when you missed a call, somebody will call you back later if it's that important, right? Finding time for silence may be one of the ways that we have been guided to what the world thinks of as peace. But we as Christians know that there's a deeper kind of peace that we're craving as human beings, and that is peace with God. Since the entrance of sin into our world at the Garden of Eden, human beings have not had peace with God. That is, we've not had a right relationship with God at all times because sin cuts us off from God. It disrupts us from being one with God our Father. Think about how Adam and Eve were banished from the perfection of the Garden of Eden, Eden when they sinned, and, and how sin kept them at a distance from God and made their lives difficult. And you remember before sin entered the world, right, they were in the garden, they walked with God in the garden, and they were just one with Him. And then to have that relationship 
disrupted and cut in two. And we, who are the sons of Adam and daughters of Eve, have indeed been born sinful. That's often referred to as original sin, isn't it? In addition, each one of us has sinned in our own thoughts and words and deeds. And apart from that own original sin, so we've had our own troubles that we've had, the issues that separate us from God. But Paul reminds us in Romans 3.23 when he wrote, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's no getting around that fact. Every one of us has sinned. There's no sugarcoating it or glossing over it that we're all, we're, we're really good people down in. No, that's really not even what it is. We are all sinners. And God knows it, and we know it too. And that's why God declared a plan to save us when he said to Satan in Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. And he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. See, God made it clear that he would send a Savior to be born of a woman to reunite himself and crush the power of sin and death and the devil in the process. For thousands of years, the prophets had announced that the Savior would come into the world just as God had promised. But people thought that throughout history that they just wouldn't listen to what God's promise was. They all had their own ideas of what that peace that would be coming into the world was about. But people, <clears throat> but they tried to, to listen and make peace with God by, first of all, building that tower up to the sky, you know, that tower of, of Babel. Well, that didn't work out so well for them, did it? And then they tried to follow other gods who didn't have God's plan in mind for them. But that didn't work out either. Those false gods did not save them. And then they tried to overthrow the power of other nations around them to save themselves from destructions. But in the process, they were overpowered by other nations. And then, into this broken and divided world, God sent his own son, Jesus, as a little baby, born of a woman, humbly, to take on our flesh and blood as a human being. But at the same time, he was also fully God. He led a sinless life, and he and his Father were one. And Jesus spent his ministry telling his disciples and anyone who would listen that he was the one who would bring the world peace. And at the synagogue in his hometown of Nazareth, the Lord read these words from the prophet Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord of God is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And we find that in Isaiah 61. And then he said, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And then, the passage he quoted and the statement he made are found in Luke chapter 4. But the people at that time, they didn't believe him. And in fact, drove him out of town in anger. And then Jesus said to the disciples, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and then be killed. But on the third day, he will be raised. But guess what? They didn't listen or pay attention either. Peter even took Jesus inside and said, Oh, Lord, no, this can't be true. Far be it from you, Lord, but this shall never happen to you, is what Peter said. Peter did not want this to happen to his rabbi and master. And to be honest, we don't want it to happen to him either. But... Jesus knows the mission that he was called to do on this, to bring peace on earth to this world. And to bring peace between us sinners and God must include the cross. The cross that Jesus stood or laid upon. And he did not turn away from his mission even when he was praying to God in the Garden of Gethsemane. And then to, when that angry mob was beginning to move in and that seemingly that quiet place 
you know, suddenly disturb the disciples sleeping. Jesus said to the disciples, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough, for the hour has come. The Son of Man is to be betrayed into the hand of sinners. Rise, let us get going. You see, my betrayers are at hand. And at Jesus' arrest, Peter again did not want Jesus arrested or to go down this road of suffering. So he pulled out his sword and cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest there. And then what was Jesus' response? He said, put your sword back in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. And we find that in Matthew 26. Jesus sought peace even then, even in the midst of the turmoil that was going on around him in that peaceful, uh, usually peaceful garden. But ultimately, it was the cross that had that peace between us and God that came down that Jesus found and gave to us. And so when the, on the crucified cross that Jesus breathed his last, the Bible says, Jesus said, and behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. That temple curtain torn in two that separated the people from the Holy of Holies, from where God resided in that temple. It was torn in two at Christ's death, showing that that sin, that, that price that we had to pay, be paid for sin, it was paid fully through Jesus. We are no longer separated from God. And so what do these verses tell us? They tell us that because of Jesus' death on the cross, we now have access to the Father. We can approach him through the most holy of holies. And we also have the barrier of death destroyed. Our sin and death no longer separates us from God. We have a new life in Christ, which will soon be revealed more fully to us on Easter, when Jesus' tomb was opened and he himself rose from the dead. And the cross has become a sign of peace for us here on this earth and in our church today. We often see the sign of the cross made to acknowledge Christ's presence in this world, especially during our worship. And then we make the sign of the cross sometimes on the forehead and also on the chest of a baby being baptized to mark them as one redeemed by Christ the crucified. The pastor sometimes makes the sign of the cross when they speak the benediction over the congregation. The Lord make his face shine upon you and give you his peace. Amen. And that we find that in number six, that particular blessing that we share. But when we share Jesus' peace, we're reminded of the words of Jesus shortly before his crucifixion. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives to you. Don't let your hearts be troubled, and neither let them be afraid. Don't you just love those words of Jesus? There's such great comfort in them that there's a confidence that we have. Jesus says later, And now I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you, and so that when it does take place, you may believe. He's talking about his own suffering, his passion, and his death here. And he was saying to his disciples, and he's saying to you and to me, that these words, remember with me when you see the cross. Remember what I said, and remember what you are witnessing is me bringing everlasting, eternal peace. Peace that will connect you with God our Father forever and always. And so be guided to the cross. Be guided to his peace and live in that peace as we interact with each other during this Lenten and other seasons of our life. So our challenge for you this week is who will you bless with peace this week 
as we pass on the peace that Christ gives to all of us. May the peace of Christ be with you always. Amen. Would you be in the attitude of prayer? Lord Jesus, we thank you for the peace that you give us, not the peace that the world gives to us. So Lord, even in the midst of the turmoil of this world, help us to find the peace that we can only find in you. And no matter what is happening around us, no matter what chaos and turmoil and sickness that is going around, that we can always center ourselves on you and find the peace that you give us each and every day, that peace you gave us on the cross. Amen. And now we're going to join in our hymn of response this morning. Uh, it's hymn number 295, In the Cross of Christ I Glory.
break these tithes and offerings in front of you today, Lord. May you bless them and may you multiply them with others from around our community and nation so that they can provide that relief from today's world of chaos and turmoil. The people going through natural disasters can, we can provide uh, simple items like blankets and, and flood buckets and relief and food so that they can try to get back to some sort of normalcy and have the basic necessities of life. And for those that are struggling with other things around us, that we can provide things like the food pantry that can provide food and clothing and things that they need to keep warm and, and be well nourished. And thank you for giving us these opportunities in life, Lord. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Now is our time to lift up our joys and concerns to the Lord. What joys and concerns we have to lift up today? Uh, obviously for the family of Bill Douglas, uh, who was laid to rest yesterday. And I also heard Dean's not feeling well. So we just lift him up as well. Others today? We did have a couple of joys in our family. We had two birthdays. It was kind of an unusual week because Brandon had to work during our birthday dinner. And Dean wasn't feeling well, so Kelly couldn't be there. So we celebrated a birthday dinner without them. <laughs> All right! That's what you really love, isn't it? Excellent. Well, I'm glad that you're able to celebrate birthdays. And you know you were loved because, well, they went ahead and celebrated you. <laughs> See? You didn't have to be there to be celebrated. Think of it that way. We have a joy to see Margaret back in worship with us again today. So, so it's great to see you out and about. Well, it's not foggy. It's not foggy. That is true. Yeah. That is true. And there's no ice on the road. And, yeah. It's kind of beautiful. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Lord, we just come before you with our concerns of our hearts and the joys that we have celebrated throughout the week, and we give them to you, Lord. But Father, for those joys that we have, those highs that we have, we just thank you. And even though there was turmoil because, well, Brandon couldn't be there to celebrate his his own birthday, and Dean couldn't be there, you know, to be around uh, as well with Kelly to, because he was ill. The celebration went on. People were still honored, even in their absence. And so, Lord, we just thank you for uh, the gift of birthdays and the gift of celebrations that can go on. And Father, we also need to lift up Dean and those others with our uh, church family who are not feeling well. Uh, may you provide the comfort and relief and, and let them get over this sickness easily and quickly. And Father, for all the other folks that just can't be in worship with us today, we just ask you to wrap your loving arms around them. Let them know that they are missed and we are continuing to pray for them. And Father, for those who are in mourning, we just ask that you provide your comfort and peace that can only be found through you. Lord, let them celebrate the, the love that they had for their family members and friends. We ask all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, as we join in the prayer which your Son has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins. As we forgive those who sin against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we prepare our hearts for a communion this morning, let's confess our sins to God and ask His forgiveness. Would you join me in prayer? Almighty God, you have called us to peace, but so often we chose strife and anger. We do not seek to follow your will and walk in love. Instead, we listen to the temptations of the world around us, and we are often the cause of strife. We live according
according to our own selfish desires. Have mercy on us and forgive us. Lead us each day to follow our Savior. Let's take this time to silently reflect in prayer with our God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. God has had mercy on us. He sent his son Jesus, the Prince of Peace, to suffer and to die for our sins, to bring us with peace with God and with one another. So I announce to you that your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, set the cross of Jesus before us to guide us in the way of peace. Amen. On that night, when Jesus was betrayed. He was having that Passover meal with his disciples in the upper room. And he took the bread and he lifted it to heaven and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them and said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way after the meal, he took the cup and he lifted it to heaven and he once again gave thanks and he gave it to his disciples and said, Drink of this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Would you be in a word of prayer with me? Father God, as we are reminded of this mighty acts of you and your son Jesus, willingly going to the cross to pay our debt for our sins, so that we can be in a relationship with you. We ask that you take these simple elements of bread and juice so that they may be for us the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus, and remind us how much you love us, that you sent your one and only Son to pay the price for our sin, and that your Son was so obedient that he did it on the cross because he knew in the power that you had promised of resurrection. And it's with that same hope that we look to be resurrected with Christ at the end of our days here on this earth. Thank you for this beautiful gift that you have given us. Amen. The table of Christ is now set before us in this room. You may come forward as you let. Now we're going to celebrate, we're going to celebrate uh, our closing hymn. It's number 384, Love Divine, All Loves Its Own. You would stand if you're able in your posture or in the spirit as we do this. <laughs>
said that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times, in every way. The Lord be with you. Amen. <laughs>